Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us for another Walk In My Shoes series session, where today we will be discussing behavioural segmentation and impact investing and the implications for professional advisors. My name is Zofia Sahanik, and I am the Director of Membership and Development here at Philanthropy Impact and your moderator for this series. As a not-for-profit membership organisation, we exist with the aim to increase and improve philanthropy and social investment and to also encourage impact investing. We do this by working with professional advisors to private clients to increase your knowledge and skills in advising clients in their sustainability and impact journeys. If you have any questions about what we do, the training we offer and how we can collaborate, please get in touch with me directly in the chat today. We do like to keep these sessions really strictly to 30 minutes, which goes very quickly, but we also encourage questions and input from our audience. For this reason, we ask that you use the chat function to introduce yourself, to have your say and also post questions to our panel. Please make sure to add panellists and all attendees if you'd like to interact on the chat and remain respectful to all throughout. Our chair for today's session is Rennie Hall, partner and head of philanthropy at Seahaw & Co. And joining Rennie, we welcome Amy Clark, who's the co-founder and chief impact officer at Tribe Impact Capital, Greg Davies, head of behavioural science at Oxford, Oxford Risk, Eric Lonergan, macro hedge fund manager and economist and a writer, um, and thank you all, sorry, thank you all for joining us today. <laughs> and I will now hand over to Randy to make a start. Well, thank, thank you for the fantastic introduction. I think, I think we're set for a really, really interesting conversation. Um, before plunging straight into it, I, I think because we've got um, such a, a fantastic spread of expertise here on the panel, I think it's worth spending 30 seconds just quickly going round um, Eric, Greg and, and Amy and getting them to introduce their area of expertise just so then in your minds you can you can see how it all meshes together and so Amy if I could um, please start with you and the the very the very quick context setting would be wonderful please. I'm very happy to Renny and thank you for the invite I, I'm very obviously the one without the beard um, seeing as I seem to be surrounded by everybody else who has beards <laughs> Uh, so as um, as has been mentioned, I am one of the co-founders and uh, actually, John, you don't have a beard. Um, one of the co-founders and the chief impact officer at Tribe Impact Capital, which is a 100 percent dedicated wealth manager focusing on moving capital materially to deliver the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Accord. So my role very much is around that impact thesis, um, both upstream, working with our clients and helping them articulate what change they want to see in the world as it relates to the SDGs. And then downstream in um, the actual investment thesis, what we then go and invest in and matching those two upstream and down to, uh, downstream worlds together. Fantastic, and I think, I think We'll, we'll certainly want to draw on that practical experience um, as, as we get into the discussion. Eric, if, if I could come to you, please, um, uh, an equal uh, to quick 30 seconds of, of context setting, please. Oh, sorry, you're on mute. Hi, thanks, Rennie, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm a macro fund manager and economist. Uh, I've written a book which uh, came out last year called Angrynomics. And I guess I've been involved in impact invest investment in a personal capacity for 10 years or so. Fantastic. Thank you. And, and Greg, um, third on the list and uh, an update from you, please. Thanks. Yes. Hi, I'm Greg Davis. I'm head of behavioral finance at Oxford Risk. Uh, we effectively build software to help people make better financial decisions. Um, and part of better when it comes to financial decision making is making sure that people's financial solutions fit not just their narrow financial needs, but their broader emotional and social needs. So we have a very deep interest in applying behavioral science to this question of how you unlock demand for impact in ESG investing. I think I think let's let's get straight into it then, Greg, because uh, um, alluding to that fact that um, behavioural finance, behavioural science can can be used to understand clients' demand for impact and ESG investing. It'd be great to, to slightly unpick how how does that work in practice? Well, what, what we want to do is to be able to unearth someone's preferences. Uh, when it comes to traditional investing, you know, we have to assess someone's risk preferences, and maybe they have a preference for liquidity, 
And it's all very complicated, but actually it's not when compared to when you start thinking about people's social preferences. It's, you know, which causes do I like? Am I more of an E person, an S person, a G person? How much do I want to represent, to reflect my values in my portfolio versus philanthropy? And so what we want to do is take that complexity away from the end client and away from the advisor because it's daunting. And a lot of people faced with complexity just throw up their hands and go, you know what? I'll leave it till next year. So if we can build tools that are there to profile the investor, figure out what, who they are, what their preferences are, and then map that onto a set of investment solutions so we can go and hand it to them on a plate or to the advisor on a plate and go, we know this thing, this solution, this ESG solution is right for this client because this is who they are. You've basically taken an awful lot of hard work out of the process and you've managed to connect demand to supply much, much more readily. And, and Amy, when, when thinking about this, this profiling um, in practice, Tribe uh, used an impact DNA process to, to take their clients from thinking about the sustainable development goals, what, what their um, particular needs are. How, how does that, how does that profiling work? How, how do people, if you're going through the impact DNA process, what, what does that feel like? Um, so Greg knows because Greg, <laughs> Greg helped, um, helped us deliver it and develop it. So thank you, Greg. Um, and it's based very much in many ways. It's a, it's a collision of three different worlds. It's a collision of Greg's world, um, Sober Hebel Finance. Um, it's a collision of my world, sustainability, um, and then it's a collision of the very traditional regulatory world in terms of the questions that we must ask um, our clients. And it's really bringing those three worlds together to say, OK, let's create um, an intervention that allows us to really extract from our clients the essence of who they are, really, what they care about, why they care about it. Um, how they want to see that manifest in the world. And we use the sustainable development goals, as I mentioned and alluded to earlier. We use that as the fabric and the framework through which we engage our clients. So helping them effectively map themselves to those SDGs. Um, it's gamified. Um, so there's an element of gamification in it because we tend to find that when you engage people through the art of play, <laughs> um, it actually helps them express themselves sometimes far more easily and far faster than they would if we said, OK, you know what, Rennie, tell me what your top three values are and your top three areas of change. You know, you're going to sit there and feel quite confronted by that question because, you know, you have values and you know that you want to see change in the world, but you might struggle to articulate that. So by gamifying it and creating a really fun intervention, it becomes a very low stress environment for clients to be able to say, well, look, this is why I care about this and this is what I care about. It's also a phenomenal opportunity for us to help them understand what the SDGs actually really are, what each metric and target associated with each one of those goals actually means in investment language um, as well. So it's, it's, it's a really fun, um, it can be quite light touch. You know, some of our clients go through it very, very quickly. Sometimes it can be an absolute cathartic kind of um, explosion of emotion that we get out of our clients and we can be there three sometimes four hours after we've started the conversation with clients just downloading all of this almost this angst that some of them have had for a long period of time and they've wanted to be able to take action they never have um, it's modular so again designed to be really fun so you kind of walk through it um, and it's sequential um, as well the, the, the one thing that we often get asked about, sorry, the dogs just turned up and they started to drink. So you can probably hear that in the background. <laughs> I really apologize. I've got ch children playing in the garden. So e e equal amounts of um, uncontrollable animal here as well. Marvellous. I'm not alone then. Um, the one thing that we're often asked, um, Rennie, is where the financial sort of the regulatory requirements um, sit within that. Um, obviously pre um, you know, where do the regulatory requirements sit within that? And the one thing that we made a very conscious decision of right from the word go was to not lead with the financial risk parameters, because we felt very much that that was the tail that would wag the dog. We needed to invite our clients in on a values and a, sort of an emotion and an impact point of view first, get them to really interrogate why they felt the way that they did about certain issues. So for example, 
you know, if, if uh, equality and specifically gender equality wasn't coming through as a particular area of interest, what we often find is people sitting there going, gosh, that's really interesting. Why do I think like that? I don't know why I think like that. And actually, that makes me feel uncomfortable that I am thinking like that. So sometimes you get these really, really deep, quite meaningful conversations with clients, which we, you wouldn't get if you led with finance first. So we we sort of pivoted it to say we've got to allow people the opportunity to really express themselves. Uh, I think that's you're talking about a, a deeply powerful force where where people are I, identifying deep trends within them, and I I think Eric, you'll be fascinating to hear from from your side when looking at big macro trends. Are are you seeing this greater movement towards ESG and um, impact investing manifesting in macro trends or similarly from your clients that are coming to you are they demanding different things which means that you're having to execute your mandates slightly differently um, it'd be great great to understand where where impact plays in in the macro scheme of things sure thanks Ray. I'd say I think there's a uh a tidal wave of change happening, which is very evident at the macro level. Um, I think comparing this to the advent of shareholder capitalism in the 1980s is an entirely fair comparison. Um, so there's a sweeping change through capital markets and public markets, you know, for stocks and shares and bonds, anything, any, any listed securities now are coming under uh, considerable scrutiny for an ESG assessment. And I think it's, it's very interesting. It appears to have accelerated dramatically post COVID, um, which may be because there's a broader societal and cultural change about what we can do faced with a crisis if we need to. So I think that's a big component of it. There's been huge momentum from regulatory change, and this is fascinating, in the case of the European Union, simply disclosure has transformed the industry. So due to European regulation uh, implemented by the European Commission now, all asset managers who are selling their products into Europe, which is pretty much all of the global asset management industry, as of this month have been required to provide disclosure on ESG risks. Now, that may seem like a technical development, but I think it's culturally transformative because, as we all know, once you disclose things, um, it forces you to think about things differently and it focuses the mind. So I think that's the, the, the second major factor. And for sure, um, we're seeing a transformation in terms of client demands. And I think this is impacting even what I do, which is right at the, the top level of asset allocation and macro investing. And we are now trying to get um, more ESG compliant you know, ETFs, even I think futures, uh, we're going to see a, a transformation, I think, of, of the universe. Which I think, I think is exciting and, and seeing this, this huge wave of, of change is, um, is, is deeply encouraging. Greg, from, from your research and the tools you're putting together, it, it sounds like it's, this isn't just a homogenous wave that's hitting us there's there's quite a lot of bifurcation be great to understand a bit a bit more about how how things split out and the nuances of it yeah absolutely and, and i think that's a vital point you know i've already made the point that we need to make this easy for people but it's not just easy it's pulling the right heartstrings um even in standard finance no one really buys a risk return trade-off what people buy are stories they buy narratives and this becomes vitally important when we start talking about responsible investing, ESG investing. And so, you know, to, to be able to collect data, we now have data on thousands of investors from US, Canada, UK, across Asia, et cetera. And we can use that data to start uh, statistically analyzing attitudes and partitioning people into archetypes or groups or clusters. And once you know for a, a given group of people that you know, well, here's a common pattern of the degree to which people want to be engaged. 
their willingness to think of it, to be think of this as a balance or a trade-off between their social um, preferences and their financial preferences. Which particular UN SDGs that are most attracted and drawn to? What it enables you to do is to really start hyper-personalizing the narrative that you that you give people. Firstly, to make them comfortable with approaching this novel and complex world. Secondly, with actually investing, pulling the trigger, that, that moment of I'm in cash and I'm moving to investing is for many people a very emotionally uncomfortable thing. And if you can give people the sense that this is right for you because it matches your profile, that's good. And then also performance reporting, impact reporting. I can go back and talk to your portfolio. Which particular sub investments or narratives do I draw out to make you feel that the genuine warm glow of the, of the good you're doing? And if we can hyper personalize all of that, what you've effectively done is take something daunting and, you, and you've, you've made it feel personal to people in a way that that matches them. And we do um, both in Europe and in the US when we run broad attitudinal clusters across the population, we see about reliably six groups of people. And I won't go into them all. Two of them, th bottom 30 percent are roughly people who aren't that interested. Half of those because they're not very nice and half of those because they just can't be bothered. Um, then in the middle, there's a sort of an average group. The 30 percent at the top. Uh, and so, by the way, this is important because that 30 percent reliably everywhere we go, we find that roughly 70 percent of the population, if you tell them what this is, they want to be involved in it in some way. And sometimes it's light touch, but sometimes it's more. That 30% at the top splits into two really interesting groups. There are the, the more traditional altruists. I want my portfolio to be green. I want it to represent my values, but I don't want it to cost me anything. And then the really interesting is the 15%, which seems to be a growing group of the people who really want to understand how do I maximize my social bang for buck? How do I construct my portfolio genuinely, not just to paint it green, but to, to, to meet the combination of my financial and social preferences. And our sense is that that group will keep growing. The people who become more and more demanding about the social good that is being doing per unit of pound they invest. And that's, I think, I think that's, that's a, a fascinating development and people really thinking about how can they bring to bear all of their assets to, to make the impact that they, they want to. I, I think Greg and Amy, you, you both alluded to the sustainable development goals and we certainly hear them spoken about much more of a useful toolkit for identifying um, trends and investments that can be gone after. Eric, I'd, I'd be fascinated to hear how the sustainable development goals match up into, into map trends and are they as useful a toolkit as they have been um, in both Amy and, and Greg's explanation of things? I think they are. Um, I think obviously the you know as as this as the kind of shift in values and beliefs spreads to different parts of public markets measurement and a lot of these and a lot of the associated issues are becoming more complicated so for example one of the things we're looking at at the moment and we're not alone is how do we think of this for example in the case of say sovereign bond issuance now this is clearly a hugely complicated area because um, you want to think about how are we going to impact policy making because again there's really no point in just you know, classifying or even ranking different types of sovereigns if one doesn't engage. Um, which sovereigns do you think you can engage with effectively? Um, th these are a whole set of uh, complex questions. I think the SDGs play a role in that. But, you know, my own personal view to some extent is that there's a tendency within our industry to, 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 to overwork on the measurement side um, because it kind of fits our natural predisposition to try and quantify things. Whereas actually, I think when it comes to something at the level of complexity, for example, at the sovereign level, broadly what we're interested in is the direction of travel and often the direction of travel um, can be a lot clearer. 
really interesting. I, I think I it's just helpful to understand where, how far you can stretch uh, different definitions and, and bits of understanding. Greg, I, I saw you, you were putting up your hand as well there. Yeah, just, just a quick, quick comment on that. So the sustainable development goals, I have to say, are not ideally suited for, for understanding people's preferences. I think they've been largely designed for policy use rather than uh, you know, retail investment use, but they're well known, so they're what we've got. And if you start working with, and Amy probably has you know, a lot more insight on a client, you know, individual basis of doing this, some of them are really difficult to understand what's going on, you know, partnerships for global change, but what actually am I investing in? Um, as someone who is chair of a, uh, an, an arts and culture charity, you're hard pressed to find arts and culture and sustainable development goals anywhere unless you really are prepared to dig under the bonnet. So I don't think they're great, but we need to we need to take the stuff that people are familiar with and start working with it. And as an industry, we do have a tendency to replicate jargon. Um, you know, we have data that shows in the US, fewer than 20% of the investor population is familiar with the term ESG. And yet this is the one that the industry seems to be going with again and again, probably because it's easy to spell. But um, you know, this doesn't match investors. They, they, don't, they don't care about this jargon in these terms. What they want is a narrative that they can understand in their terms. Um, and, and that, that I think, so cut, cutting through to, to things which are real worlds, it, it, that's, that's the, the trick of a, a lot of um, client engagement and, and really building um, movements as well. Sorry, Eric, you're coming back. No, just to make it if I could just make a quick, very quick follow-up point on that, I, I think what Greg said is absolutely correct. And, and unfortunately, this is an area where, you know, full of acronyms and, and a lot of jargon. One thing that I think is re very relevant is one source of repeated pushback is about whether values are subjective. And I think this is where it does help to have international standards and United Nations standards specifically. Because actually what you can say is, well, no, this isn't a matter of opinion. This is an international standard. And to some extent, it's an appeal to a universal value. And I think that is a very important um, point at which to shift the discussion. And Amy, you, I think I think understanding how that applies to, from a tribe perspective would be really mm -hmm. fascinating. Well, Greg, you know, Greg's right. I mean, it's a policy framework. Um, but what it does as a policy framework is set the guardrails for society and business in terms of the future that we need to create. Um, and what that then means from an investment point of view, that there's some translation that's required. It's a little bit of effort that needs to be put into this in order to understand what that then means in terms of the types of businesses we're looking for and the types of investment opportunities that we're looking for. Unfortunately, we are not seeing a lot of that happening out in the marketplace. We're seeing a wholesale kind of attribution of lots of different business activities to an SDG. One of the best examples is a very well-known tobacco company who released their annual report and said that they were in the business of delivering goal number three, good health and well-being. And you're like, really? Wow, this is an interesting development. Um, because the interpretation is, is, is too shallow and that suits a lot of people. Let's not beat around the bush here. It suits a lot of uh, the investment industry at large to have a shallow interpretation of the SDGs because of the extreme level of the transition and pivot that's required within finance to keep us within those guardrails. I think it pulls up a point earlier around as um, that Greg said as well, it's about making things very easy for people to understand. So we do not sit in front of our clients and go, right, let's now hothouse you on each and every one of those sustainable development goals. Let's walk you through all 17. Let's give you all the targets, all the metrics and what that then means. We've created four macro investment themes that sit over those uh, 17 goals of families of goals that work really nicely together to create a specific type of change that's articulated within those goals that sits within that guardrails those guardrails and that enables our clients to then kind of understand what it is that we're talking about and to Eric's point the route direction of travel what we need to develop and deliver over the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 years to keep us in that safe space um, and this is why I think also we've we're starting to see I think pushback on some of the metrics that are coming out as well these so-called impact calculators 
So there's a very interesting court case coming up in Germany with Decabank that's being taken to court over its impact calculated by one of Germany's leading consumer um, rights groups for misleading in, uh, investors in uh, a fund um, through the use of its impact calculator, given the caveats, the assumptions and the paucity of data and the fact that none of that's actually been disclosed. So we're going to start to see people, I think, you know, clients getting more familiar with the SDGs um, as a language, although they may not necessarily refer to it as the SDGs, they'll just know it as this is just what future fitness looks like, this is what sustainable development looks like, this is what good looks like. But we're also going to see clients, I think, start to hold uh, asset managers to account and wealth managers to account over what they are disclosing and what they're not disclosing, but the quality of what they're disclosing as well. And I think I think that's, that's deeply powerful. There's... Um, in in the chat there was a there's a question about the big exchange um which is obviously an investment um platform set up by the big issue group and nigel kershaw and how successful that will be i um i think it's it looks like it should be quite successful because it goes to that level of simplicity and actually ties into explain things at their most basic but it's not trying to overcomplicate things and I think Amy you're flagging a, a hugely important point of if you're putting too much science behind something that doesn't have the evidence there um, you can actually run into huge complications because you're you're actually doing a complete disservice to the market. Absolutely. And full disclosure, I, I sit on the board of Big Issue Invest, which is not um, contrary to popular belief, the uh, the um, owner, if that's the right word, of the big exchange, but it's part of the same family of the big, ex big exchange. And I'm very, very supportive of the work that Nigel has done there. And I think it, it, it should absolutely be successful because I think all investors, no matter how, and this is everybody on this call, everybody on this panel, we're all becoming acutely aware of two things. One, the risk of not investing this way. Um, and two, the opportunity that has been taken away from us for so many years of being able to reflect what we really care about in our wealth. And there's this wave of almost, as I mentioned it earlier, this wave of kind of pent up angst that people just want to express and get out and say, okay, actually I can do this now. This is great, I can reflect myself, but also crikey, look, actually if I don't manage these these um, risk areas like climate, for example, then actually maybe my wealth isn't gonna perform the way that I need it to as well. So what Nigel and the team, Jill and the team are doing over there is uh, really, really important work. Um, and it is grounded in real, really robust um, monitoring due diligence and evaluation. So I hope it does really well. Um, Absolutely. I will hand over to John because I think there's um, sort of stuff from the philanthropy impact side, which which is also analogous. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Eric, Greg, Amy, uh, Renee. Uh, the um, I didn't want to cut in because the uh, I mean, we're going to go over time, I, uh, so don't worry about that. Um, because this it, is it's just a, a wonderful discussion and really fascinating. Uh, it's very clear that the interest in impact investing is growing. We've done a lot of work and with the help of Amy and Greg and others have uh, designed a training course for wealth advisors to help them deal with this uh, because it's really uh, dealing with trying to uh, deal with people's values and motivation, ambitions and goals is uh, really quite important. And so we have now a, a training program that we're going to launch and, and thank you again for your help in doing that. Um, so uh, final words of, of wisdom. Uh, let's start with Greg. Yeah, I think my, my, my closing thing is that what's of interest to me is how we scale this. And for me, that's about understanding the range of, of attitudes and preferences and then building that into solutions. Now those solutions could be indices, they could be investment products. They could be tools to put in the hands of advisors to help them go out to the mass affluent market and reach a wider range of people. I mean, a Amy and Tribe already, already have this, but if you really want to reach the, you know, the huge bulk of people, it needs technology to push it out massively. And then onto uh, self-directed platforms. You just need to, to enable people to feel more comfortable with it. So scale is, I think, 
what what's most important for me. Um, it's it's brilliant. I took the I I took it uh, from Amy's group uh, just to see what it was like. It was it was a lot of fun, Amy. So it was more than just sort of hard work. Eric, final words. I think there's you know it, there's an incredible change of foot, and I think it is immensely complicated, and aspects of it are going to be extremely difficult. But I think what I find most encouraging at a sort of macro level is I think we are, despite some challenges, getting an extraordinary alignment of incentives, which is, is, is really, really gathering momentum. And I think you know, the job of all of us is to make sure this momentum persists. And we just need to be wary to the aspects of the system that are trying to free ride, uh, you know, or as Amy alluded to, um, where people are just, you know, pr presentation isn't, isn't met with, with genuine delivery. So I think one must have a combination of a very high degree of optimism about what's happening, but also an equivalent level of vigilance to make sure that what's happening is as effective uh, as it can be. Thank you. Amy. Sorry, my mute button stuck there. Um, agree with what Eric said, agree with what Greg has said. Um, closing thoughts, this really isn't rocket science. This is a human to human conversation that we have with our clients. It's not a banker to human or a wealth manager to human. It's a human to human conversation. And that's something that I think is culturally a big shift for the industry. Um, you know, bring your values into the workplace and have that human to human you know, interaction with your colleagues um, and with your clients. I think the cautionary note with that is that as you move more into this space, as you start to advise clients more on this, as you start to place more investment um, capital into these types of vehicles, be aware that the mirror is two facing. So your clients will start to ask you what you are doing with your business, not just what the investee companies are doing as well. So you've got to be ready to work as hard inside your organization to create the change across all of the different divisions that you have as much as you are with the businesses you're investing in. Major, major impact on the culture and behavior of those organizations. And Renee, final words to you. I, I just think it's been absolutely fantastic as a panel. So thank, thank you very everyone for contributing. There is a huge and deep amount of expertise here. And I, I think my um, final summing up statement is I would commend to you to have a look at what, what John is, is putting together in terms of the training, because taking that huge amount of knowledge and turning it into something that's digestible and usable is it's no mean feat so I think certainly I'd I'd say go have a look and, and see see whether it works for you. Yeah. Thanks Renee. Uh, Sophia final word. I just want to say that was brilliant it's one of my favorites so far and we we're a, a year now that we've had this this discussion going on with walking my shoes so I just want to really say a huge thank you to everyone that joins in all the time we've, we've had a really great group of people joining for lots of different discussions and so much feedback has been positive so thank you all very much um, anyone that's interested in the training that John's mentioned please get in touch with Victoria she's just put her email address in the chat and following on from this next week we'll be back with walking my shoes looking at impact measuring <laughs> what's new across the sector um, I don't think we're going to answer all of the questions you guys have raised today but it's going to be a really interesting session so have a great week everybody thank you very much <laughs>